Second of September. Second of September. Okay. Some of y'all be dove hunting that weekend, but yeah. those of you can stay here. <laughs> Bear with me. We'll get everything set up here. So last week we talked about the basic concepts of evolution, and we crossed off pretty well these first two. The natural process was capable of forming everything. You need no supernatural. That just the laws of physics as we know it can create practically everything. And we crossed out that we have evolved gradually over millions of years because obviously when your dating process says that there's 500,000 year old rock and you find a spark plug in it, I don't think you figured out how old the earth is. So anyway, we're going to look at these next two. And this is where you start seeing some really big assumptions being made. It's that the common traits, things that we have in common with other critters, are evidence of common ancestry, that we all evolve from common ancestor. And one of these is embryology. Now basically what embryology is, and some of you have probably seen these pictures before, but it's where you study the embryos of different species at different stages of development. Now in this book we have this picture right here, and it's in the book that I showed you all, took it last semester. And basically what they're saying here, if you read underneath, it says, uh, all shown separated from the yolk sac and remote the remarkable similarity of these four embryos at the early stage of development. And from this they get this interesting statement. It says, one important fact remains clear. Darwin's theory of common descent is strengthened enormously by the many homologies found among developmental stages of organisms belonging to developmental species. So basically what they're saying here is that because they look the same, man, that's hard fire proof that they all evolved from a common ancestor. Even though three paragraphs before they say this, but the embryos of descendants do not necessarily resemble the adults of their ancestors. However, even early development undergoes evolutionary divergence among groups. So basically they say, yeah, if they're all the same, it means they evolved, but it really doesn't. Let's look at this picture a little bit closer. Now there's a very, very, very important word in this paragraph that I want you to notice, and it's this. All of these pictures you see here have been separated from their yolk sac. Now this drawing here, it's been around for a long time. It was made up by a couple buddies. One was a zoologist named Ernest Heckel, and the other was K.E. Von Baer. And this is what their drawings look like. They took the embryos of all these different creatures, fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, rabbit, and human, and lined them up together and said, man, don't those look similar. Man, that's the best evidence of evolution we've ever seen. Right? Old Heckle here thinks he's got it all figured out. So these are his drawings. This is what they actually look like. A little different. Especially the salamander. Way different. And what you're seeing on the salamander and some of the differences you see in these other ones is what they say they removed, which was the yolk sac. Say, well, that's not really important. Well, it really is. It's a nutritional source during development. And you can read a few things just by looking at this nutritional chamber on an embryo. If it's big, it means that the embryo is born in adult form. And if it's small, that means the embryo is probably going to develop through larval phases. Now, on salamanders, this is where it gets interesting. It says the yolk sac is fixed to the embryo. Those are inseparable. And on humans, it's an external feature. If you were to remove the yolk sac from creatures to which it is attached, it would damage the embryo and alter the body structure. So really, when you look at these drawings, you think, okay, the yolk sac is attached to these creatures up where we all can see. And you told us that when you remove it, it causes extreme damage to the body. So when you remove the yolk sac, how can we know for sure they look this similar? They're, again, an assumption but they have to remove that part because otherwise they don't look similar at all. And the argument falls apart. Speaking of our man Heckle here, you know, we, we try to develop, if he's a trustworthy guy, we trust what he says. He made a very, you know, very intelligent statement here. He was on the Gina trial several years ago and he was asked on trial, why do you believe in spontaneous generation? Everything from nothing. It's been disproven so many times. And in his own words, he said, because if it wasn't true, we'd have to believe in a creator. Smart guy. We start to get to the root of the issue. It's not overwhelming evidence. It's an assumption that fills in for what we know to be true. Another big one is DNA. All right, we talked in the first week when we explained it, and I'm not gonna explain how it all works again because it's so complex. 
It's just amazing, the handiwork of our creator. Every living thing has DNA made of the same four base nucleotides, right? Guanine, cytosine, thymine, adenine. Now again, here we make a massive assumption. Evolutionists will say that because everything has DNA, obviously we came from a common ancestor, right? I mean, that just screams it, don't it? Go to the next one here. Richard Dawkins, we talked a little bit about Richard Dawkins a few weeks ago. This was his statement concerning it. He said, the reason we know for certain we are all related, including bacteria, is the universality of the genetic code and other biochemical fundamentals. He said, now because every, all the DNA is made of these same four base nucleotides, that's proof to me that we're all related. Then he goes on to say this. He says, my philosophical commitment to materialism and reductionism is true, but I would prefer to characterize it as a philosophical commitment rather than real explanation. So what he says here, he says, see, the real reason I believe this is because that's what I'm philosophically tied to. That's my belief system. Not because the evidence shouts it. It's because I'm, I'm putting on the red glasses and everything looks red, if that makes sense. So you think, okay, well, if it's not, let's think about it in our terms. If it's not evidence of common ancestry, why would God create everything with DNA out of the same four base nucleotides? Well, to put it quite simply, if he didn't, the only thing we could eat is each other. <laughs> Think about it, right? The cow that has the same DNA eats the grass that creates the milk that we can drink or that we can eat the meat. And because the DNA in that substance is the same as ours, the information can be transcripted and shared with each other. And it can be broken down, it can be put into your bloodstream, and we can digest it. If it was a completely foreign substance, We'd have nothing to eat but each other because that's the only way our food and our in internal juices and chemicals could communicate that information. To me, that's not evidence of common ancestry. It's evidence of somebody knew what they were doing, right? Not to mention, I'm a big meat eater. Thank the Lord he made everything with DNA. <laughs> Graze around like a cow. That'd be miserable. Now, this came out several years ago, and this really shook the foundations of a lot of creationists because we'll talk a lot about human evolution in the last segment, but basically what they want you to believe is that the first primate to turn into this human phase was a chimpanzee. So they took the chimpanzee's DNA and they lined it up next to a human's DNA and they made this, this statement here that says that homologous DNA sequences of humans and chimpanzees are approximately 99% similar in base sequence. Now again, everything having DNA doesn't prove common ancestry. So if this was true, does that prove that they're our ancestor? No. And there's two words I really want you to look at here. It's homologous and similar. So it's basically mean the same thing. So what they said here is we took some DNA that looks similar and put them next to each other and discovered they were pretty similar. <laughs> That's basically what it means. Now, the information I'm about to give you comes from a secular science organization. This did not come from creationist group, but it has been verified by several. When they conducted this test, let's see what the next slide looks like. You see, again, all DNA is made of these same four base pairs. Now what they want you to think is that they strung out the whole strand of chimp DNA and the whole strand of human DNA and looked at it and said, no, gone, they were similar. And that's really not what happened. Talk about the songbooks, right? Most of these songbooks, except for the ones that have some words slightly different and confuse all of us on singing night, <laughs> most of them are pretty identical, okay? I'll grab two just for this analogy. Now let's just assume that these are two of the exact ones, okay? And let's say these were exact, letter for letter, page for page, front to finish, right? Now let's say I took one of these songs and printed it three times in a row. Are these books exactly similar? Let's say I was to rearrange some of the songs and put them in different order. Are they identical? No. If I was to take some songs out, are they identical? Exactly. Remember, DNA is made of this four-letter alphabet, G, C, T, and A. I don't know why it's flickering twice like that. So here's what it would look like if we were translating DNA. These two strands right here, unless I did a typo, which I don't think I did, are identical. Now these here, look at this second one. There are, it's the same letters, 
but they're, but they're moved around. So you might say, well, they're similar because they're the same letters. Okay, but they're not identical. In fact, even switching two or three of these letters in a DNA chain can have massive implications in the differences between one and two creatures. It could be the difference between a fruit fly having two wings and four. And again, this last one. It's the same letters, but you've taken some out. There's gaps, so it's not identical. So basically what the secular engine did is they took this statement right here and they said, okay, well, let's not take something that looks similar and just pick and choose and rearrange it and filter it to where it fits our agenda. Let's stretch it end to end and include the ones that were taken out and mismatched and moved around and see how similar it really is. That 99% actually came out to about 70%. And again, when two or three letters rearranged makes massive changes, that's a huge difference. Not to mention, remember, you're 50% related. By the criteria they used here, you are 50% similar to a banana and 30% to a fruit fly. So does DNA similarity really prove common ancestry? I don't think so. Now what we're going to talk about next, and one of the next concepts of evolution, and this is the kicker that they still can't get over. And it's how one species branches off into another one. How the monkey turned into all these different ones that became us. You know, or how the fish became the first land mammal, because yes, they do believe that. Mercy. They say a major challenge for evolution is to discover the processes by which an ancestral species branches to form two or more descendant species. They say we still can't really figure that out. Really? Oh, come on now. Seems like you got it figured out there. If it's so hard to figure out how everything branched from a common ancestor, why does our entire human lineage look like this? Or how humans came from chimpanzees? Our first ancestor down there at the bottom, that's your great great grandpappy. Here we are, there's the Neanderthals and all these ones that, by the way, they haven't found any of those. Those are just rudimentary drawings. We'll talk a little bit about that. But again, if this is such a huge problem for you, why are you putting it in the textbooks? Why are you presenting it as factual, saying, well, a certain group mutated off and reproduced and created the next species, when you openly admit we still don't know how that happened? This, this whole idea is called the multiplication of species, and it says by some mechanism in the DNA, species have offspring that branch off and form completely new species through several intermediate phases, and the dominant ones survive and the weak ones die off. Now, for example, how this would work, see, there's your human, chimp to human, dinosaur to bird, same concept. Now how they say this would happen is simple. We've heard of uh, a mutant or mutations in the DNA. It's when basically mutation is the changing of a structure of a gene resulting in uncommon variation. And we'll look at a few examples of these. There's what a mutation looks like. For some reason in a deer's DNA, the section that coded for legs was multiplied and it created four. Now I don't see how that's an advantage. It doesn't seem like he's getting along too good there. Now let's look at how mutations work. There's a few different kinds. Now you see this original sequence is all in the same order, but then we have a thing called a base substitution, where as you see this letter T right here was substituted for a C, cyanine. We also have the original sequence where you have a base addition where one of these replicates again, but it adds itself to the chain and everything else just shifts down. We also have the base deletion. Again, we talked about this earlier. When a certain letter, in this case the T, they keep using him, that's letter discrimination, keep dropping <laughs> him out right here. Had to do that, sorry. And here's another reason of how it could look. In some cases, an entire part of the helix just falls off and you get Again, <coughs> nucleotides that have no pair and they cannot translate any information. Now here's a couple of interesting examples that they talk about. They say, well, mutations are how everything evolved. Now, the fruit fly, we've all seen these examples of how, oh, well, some had two wings, some had four wings. Some were not immune to our pesticides, some were. But at the end of the experiment, let's say that you had this big eye, one in the small eye, one in the wingless one. What are they all still classified as? A fruit fly. Again, not a new species, a slight variation. 
So what you have here, for evolution to be true, there's one vital thing a mutation would have to do, and that is to add new information to the genome, right? Because again, chemical information is how DNA works. So you have a deletion, which is where information is taken out, or where new information is substituted in, or you have, again, an addition where a piece of information duplicates itself, but again, that's a replication of existing information. That's how the deer had the four legs. It's not because something new popped up. It didn't grow a wing or it didn't grow gills. It grew an existing feature. It was a replication of existing information, not new information. Another hallmark, really one of the poster childs of evolution, we've all heard of the peppered moths. Now, this is what your normal peppered moths look like. And they lived over there in, in the old country in Britain when they were figuring out how to you know, do industry. And they started studying these fruit flies and realized that they were very well tuned to blend yeah. into the bark on certain surfaces on certain trees, and they blended in yeah. well. Well, again, there was a mutation that caused some of them to come out black, and they stuck out like sore thumbs, and they all got eaten, almost all. So this weird thing happened during the Industrial Revolution. All the coal and the fire and smoke and soot coming up out of the, all the factories coated the trees black. So now the white ones stuck out like sore thumbs, and the black ones blended in perfectly. So you had several years where all the peppered, peppered moths were black until they realized, oh, it's bad for the environment, and they got rid of it. So then the trees were washed off, and all the black ones stuck out again. So we go right back to this guy. Now again, was a new species created? And a matter of fact, how, how you should see this is because it didn't evolve into another phase after the revolution stopped. It went back to what it was. The information already existed. This is a perfect example of natural selection. They're right. You're not going to beat them on that, but it's not macroevolution. Talk about dinosaurs to birds. Get through this peppered moth we showed you. Now, the basic theory is that dinosaurs evolved down to birds. And again, by that same uh, criteria of DNA matching, they say, oh, you know, the, the DNA between the dinosaurs and birds is pretty similar. A lot of dinosaurs had two back legs, so do birds. Man, high level thinking here. Now, in these drawings, you'll notice there's a few parts that are covered here. And don't think that's by accident, it's on purpose. Now, to think of how this large dinosaur up here, so you can barely see his fingers down there, how it would have evolved wings. Now, again, we talked about how new information cannot spontaneously show up in a strand of DNA. So that rule rules it out right there. <coughs> But let's just say for, for, for a while, okay, that, that, that that's how it happened, okay? That they started to shrink because food was scarce, and so the ones that needed less food survived, and the big hungry ones just, I guess, didn't feel hungry anymore and died. But let's talk about how an arm would change to a wing. Up here, where you have an arm with claws on it, these dinosaurs could reach down. I mean, they were monstrous predators. They could reach down and grab prey and eat it. That was an advantage. If you have wings, you can fly wherever you want to. You can escape prey. You can fly down from the air. That's an advantage. But what about this? It's not a fully formed wing, nor does it have the claws to grasp prey. By natural selection, which is how they believe we all got here, this should have been weeded out. All of these intermediate phases would never have survived. So by the theory of natural selection created everything, it kind of debunks itself. And you get a serious problem, especially when, if you've ever read into, I don't have time to go into how designed the wing of a bird is. Oh my goodness. Guys making airplanes are still looking at the birds, figuring out, man, strong substance, lightweight, really, really awesome. Here we have another example. They say that land mammals turned into whales. So some of them got tired of the dry desert and decided, hey, let's go swimming. <laughs> and then some of them liked it so much that they decided to stay there, except those ones died. But the ones that evolved the blowhole and can hold their breath for a really long time, man, they stuck around, and those are our whales. Makes perfect sense, don't it? <laughs> now, again, a mutation, which is they say, well, you know, a few of them just so happened to have this mutation where they sprouted, you know, a blowhole and their lungs realigned. And that just so happened to have survived. 
right? Well, let's just look. We just proved that a mutation cannot do that. But let's just look at how something from this turns to this. Here's a few of the mutations that would have had to happen. The emergence of a blowhole with also the ability to control it. Modification of the eye for permanent underwater vision. How many of you guys have gone in the ocean and held your eyes open for very long? How many enjoyed it? <laughs> exactly. A land mammal is the same way. It would have had to change over to that. The ability to drink seawater, salt water, on a regular basis and live off of it. Now even in fish, aquatic animals, there are some that are better suited for fresh and salt water. But we can study about fish that they have mechanisms that filter that out. A land mammal does not. So a land mammal would have to develop that system and then tune it in to the seawater. The modification of skeletal structure. Now, it's very interesting, you know, they say, well, it's so obvious that whales evolved from, uh, evolved from land mammals because they have a pelvis, a vestigial pelvis that they don't need anymore. And because they quit walking on land, it just shrank. And if you go look at it in a museum, they probably have to go down and show it to you because it's so small, right? And they assume that because, well, they didn't need the legs anymore, so it shrunk. I should have had a picture of it. But outside of that, they would have had to grow a monstrous head. And their front legs would have had to lose a joint and become flippers, all by natural selection, which is hit and miss, as we just showed. The ability to nurse young underwater. That's a big one. That's... That's the whole ball game. If, you can't, if they can't nurse their young underwater, they don't reproduce. I've seen cows wait out in the pond and them calves cannot nurse underwater. I don't care how hot it is or how motivated they are. They can't do it. The origin of tail flukes on the tail. Again, where did the, how did that tail get so monstrous and develop these fins that allowed it to streamline through the water? Blubber for temperature insulation. Whales can travel and live in some very cold environments where some of these arid land mammals that they claim are their ancestors couldn't live five minutes. The replacement of teeth with these baleen bristles, which are very finely tuned for the diet that they're on. Now, just based on this, I think you've got a whale of a problem. <laughs> oh, you also throw in that the, they had to lose their hooved limbs for two large front fins. We talked a little bit about that. Let's look at the fossil record. Now, the basic theory is that, if it'll go, if evolution really happened and we had all these intermediate phases that created them, it's fairly simple. All the species that were formed during each transition should have left millions of fossils behind, especially if each one lived in its own sort of millennium for hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. Stephen Jay Gould, he was a devout evolutionist, Darwinist. He came up with this idea of punctuated evolution and equilibrium. Just talk, I'm not going to go into that. Some of y'all's eyes just got big. <laughs> but, nobody's questioning this guy on his credentials, basically. And he openly says the absence of fossil evidence for inter intermediary stages between major transitions and organic design, indeed our inability, so we can't do it, even in our imagination, to construct functional intermediates in many cases have been a persistent and nagging problem for gradualistic accounts of evolution. Darwin knew this in his day. By my theory, innumerable transitional forms should have existed. Why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the earth? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. Now somewhere in here I was going to show y'all a slide of all with the pictures of you know the transitional phases that they found, but it had just been it looked like this, so I decided to leave it out. <laughs> they haven't found them yet, even within science, out, disregarding creationists because remember they don't listen to us. We don't know what reason is. There's not one fossil that is 100% by everyone been said, man, that's a transitional link. No one has been able to agree on it. And yet here they tell us in this book that the evolutionary descent of mammals from their earliest amniote ancestors, perhaps the most fully documented transition in vertebrae history. Okay, so who's right and who's wrong? Because one of you just said that there's no evidence for it, and you say, oh, it's the, the most documented there is. And if we go back to the geologic column, right, one of the first layers that we really can get into, one of the deepest layers is the Cambrian. 
Cambrian rock layer. And supposedly, this is where we found our great 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 grandpappies. Remember the little trilobite, the little roly poly on steroids that we looked at last week and got squished on by a human footprint? That kind of hurts evolution theory. So basically, by this theory, again, if we really do have such a finely organic graduated chain, all our ancestors should be very, very easy to find in this column. The Cambrian, we zoom in on it there. This is what a little thing I like to call the Cambrian conundrum because they really have a problem that in the Cambrian layer, again, only the simplistic beings should be found in that fossil layer. And what I'm about to tell you is from Evolution News, one of the leading publications of science in the industry today. And they said the most major animal groups of animals, it's kind of repetitive, but quoting them, smart people, appear abruptly in the fossil record, fully formed, and with no fossils yet discovered that form a transition from their parent group. H hang on a second. <laughs> so in the first layer, we're only supposed to be finding these souped up roly polies and these little bitty fish. We're finding animals fully formed. Now there's a theory they came up with called the Cambrian Explosion. That something happened on Earth, I don't know what it is, but it caused very rapidly all these critters to turn into animals. But there's no evidence for it. Again, it's just an alternative to find the obvious evidence that all things were created at the same time. And they say it another way. It says most of the animals, animal groups that are represented in the fossil record first appear fully formed and identifiable to their phylum in the Cambrian some 550 million years ago. These include trilobites, echinoderms, brachiopods, mollusks, and chordates. For your information, just to break it down, we are chordates. That chord comes from the root cord, which means spinal cord. Basically, if you have a spinal cord, you're a chorded. So they found plenty of us, as well as other mammals and fish, and anything with a spinal cord that they said shouldn't have evolved for another millions of years, but they found them in the first layer. Now, I, I'm, again, I'm no great reasoner here, but it's this, this phrase here, fully formed and identifiable to their phylum, right? <laughs> Doesn't that sound remarkably like according to their kind? In Genesis 1.25, it says that God made the wild animals according to their kinds. Gee, if they were all made at once, wouldn't that explain how we all find them fully formed? The livestock according to their kinds and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. So it's just another example of how the science establishment is scrambling to find an alternative for the obvious truth buried in the crust of the earth. That we were spontaneously created by God, man, animal, fish on this earth to carry out his work and to serve him. So basically, you might think, okay, now where does rubber meet the road? Because we're missing a pretty big species, aren't we? Us. We haven't talked about how we evolved yet. I'd say we're a pretty important species. Now, again, we didn't evolve I hate to be a spoiler for next week, but we didn't evolve from monkeys. I'm just going to throw that out there. But we're going to look next week about how really, not only is evolution just false, it's very dangerous. It's a very, very dangerous idea, especially to plug into such a fragile American youth to tell them that you are meaningless, purposeless, evolved monkeys. And that that's basically all you are is a higher primate, and then they get arrested for acting like one. It's a little bit confusing. So again, next week, we're really going to dig into human evolution. Two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. My bad. I'm jumping ahead. But next section we have, hopefully we'll get it all wrapped up then. But again, even four weeks is hard to cover all of the amazing evidence for our creator. So appreciate y'all's turnout, all y'all, and just the way y'all, y'all's enthusiasm and listening along and showing up, it really has been awesome. I'm enjoying it as much as some of y'all are. So thank y'all.